How are you doing? My name is Steve Wiedemann. I am a search marketing consultant. I was asked to come share what's helped me to make about $4 million in sales over the last seven years. I'm not a salesperson, so once, uh, once the slide gets up here, I'll show you um, exactly what I've learned in sales to be able to sell. We actually don't have any salespeople at all. All of our consultants just help businesses and uh, clients come to us. My job is to try to you know, make them a, a client of ours. So if we're on here, there we go. Yep, and every, uh, every pitch has a beginning, right? We always start at the starting line. For me, it was in 2010 when I left the corporate world and I decided, you know what? I think I can sell this for myself. I've watched these agencies rip off people left and right. I wanna create transparency. I'm gonna be ethical and, and try to help local businesses with their digital marketing. And so here was me leaving the, the corporate world. I sold a SEO strategic plan for technical and contextual and off-page visibility for your, your website for 500 bucks. And uh, it took me about 30 hours to do that. It's not very much money at all. I mean, I had a couple clients, so it, it adds up. Um, and I did probably 60 to 90 hours a week. So, so we, we made good money, but I was working around the clock and I was exhausted. I didn't know what I was doing in sales. And my clients were happy because in this case, uh, one of our retail clients that I had done a strategy for, I forecasted that he make around $125,000 in new sales from like sexy Halloween costumes or something. And um, sure enough, you made that amount. And I look at the ROI and I'm like, man, $500. And I got him a 24,000 900% ROI. It's like, what am I doing? I'm, I'm providing so much value to these businesses, and yet I'm charging so little. Because at the time, they looked at SEO like, oh, you're just a developer. Oh, you're just a content person. You just do stuff, and then we do some of the implementation, and we make the money. But it was my suggestion. It was my advice. It was my experience growing up in corporate search that enabled me to be able to give them the right advice that made that revenue. So then I thought a little bit differently. And Again, the next week, you know, I made that client all that great money and I woke up the next day and I'm no clients again and I gotta get more income and I can't keep doing this. It's not sustainable. Let's see if we can keep this going. Uh, something happened to my font. Um, so in this one, create, the creative process really started right after I realized that, you know, hey, I, I can make a lot more money from this if I can show the value, if I can show the actual dollars I was able to make from clients. And what was in my arsenal at the time, in 2010, where have I been already? My corporate background um, showed my experience. I was the SEM account manager for Disneyland.com and Adventures by Disney. I worked for IBM Global Services, helping migrate um, content to the web. I worked for Pac Yolen, which you know, I had 20% uh, of the Major League Baseball as, uh, as clients. Uh, Agencia was uh, Expedia Corporate. If you were to be a business and order your travel packages through Expedia at the time, you'd go through them. I did their paid search for a year in 2009. And I'd built relationships with partners I'd worked with at Google and at the time, MSN Ad Center, which you know now is, is Bing. So every day I was on calls with these guys saying, hey, I need to get my bulk feed done for Disney. Hey, I need to you know, uh, work on my quality score. Help me out. Hey, I need some sort of help. So I had a lot of contacts and people I'd worked with directly to get really good at what I did. What else was in my arsenal? Well, results, right? Looking at 13 years of freelancing after my, my day jobs, you know, I was working until 2, 3 in the morning, sometimes 2, 3 days straight because I had such a passion for what I did. And I was able to see some pretty cool results. So you can see in this case, they got a lot of new leads. Um, and then, you know, the, the bottom number actually is the pay-per-click number. He didn't have any leads the year before. He had 454 in one month. It's kind of cool. What else was in my arsenal? Well, my expertise. I've been called upon and, and asked by several different magazines and newspapers. And again, I'm just a tech geek, so when they call and they say, hey, I know, know you know a little bit about SEO, can you give us some advice? We're working with this small startup called Fretzels. Can you give them some free advice on what to do? Well, sure, I'll show you what we would have done you know, in our Disney infrastructure. I will show you what I did you know, with some of the freelance clients I had. So I was able to get interviewed and, and put myself out there in a way that got me some nice recognition. So all those different places are you know, places that had mentioned me and recognized me as a, you know, an authority. And what else was in my arsenal? Was social proof. So here I had had, this is, you recognize this from LinkedIn. Everybody here have a LinkedIn? People look at that, like a lot. You don't think they do, but first thing they do when you're a salesperson is they, they Google your name. They look at all the different places that you've worked. And if you bounced around a lot, it's kind of a eyebrow raise of why is this guy bouncing around so much, you know? 
So it's, it's an interesting thing that people do. I look at LinkedIn all the time. Um, so here's examples of people who've left nice comments about me. And I thought, hey, this is a, this is a great way as I'm putting my arsenal together of how I'm going to go out and do a better job selling. I'm going to take all the different experience that I've earned. I'm going to take all the different recognition. I'm going to take all that social proof and try to use that as a way to increase my value in the marketplace. And I did look really good, but all of those things were not enough. It looked great on paper, lots of great logos. Anyone can walk in and say, look how amazing I am. Look at my experience. Look at my reputation. I was featured in magazines and all this stuff. But if you don't, if you don't have that, that personal touch, if you don't know how to build relationships, it's all for naught. And I was a tech geek. I still am. I still go into a lot of calls really green as you know, just a, a regular uh, you know, IT guy. Tell me about your problems. What are your issues? Um, where are you struggling? I don't, I don't immediately start off with, oh, you're from so-and-so. I got a cousin from there. And you try to find that connection you know, to, to immediately build that relationship. I'm kind of an introvert. To be honest with you, many techies are introverts. You know, we, we're really good at one thing, but we're behind the computer so much that it's hard to be social. It's even hard for me to be here doing this today. But Aaron said, show these guys how you do your proposal. So I said, all right, I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> But it's about relationships. It's about making that connection. And one thing, one day it hit me, in 2010, if I'm going to go out there and I'm going to show people how good I am, I'm not going to just brag about myself. I'm going to do something free. So I started doing website reviews. I did over 300 website reviews, a lot of really big brands too. And I would go out and I would trash their site politely in three to five minutes. In three to five minutes, I would go through all the things that um, that they're doing wrong and show them how the competitors are doing them right. I give them a sense of deficit. I would make them feel like, wow, this guy really nailed what's wrong with my site. Oh, and I need him to take it down because we look really stupid. <laughs> so they'd have to call because they'd want me to remove the video because I optimized it with SEO so that they would, their video would show up for a branded search. So it's kind of this fun little antagonizing way to get them to reach out, also showing expertise, but not being really negative in it, just kind of showing where the opportunity is. So you have to give to get, and that, that's been my mantra ever since I learned this valuable lesson. So it's about solving problems. It's, a not, it's not about coming in there and saying, you know, hey, I'm a provider. How can I help you? It's about finding where those problems are. And sometimes it's about finding them and just asking, what is your biggest pain point? If you could focus on one thing, one area this year, what would it be? And then you take that back to your desk, and you come up with an answer that solves that problem. Not necessarily the how, but at least the what. <clears throat> so my next sale was 3,500. Same plan, exact same plan. Maybe even a little scaled down. I don't think I did as much keyword research on that one, if I remember right. $3,500. We sell the same strategy now for enterprise at around 7,500. But in 2010, it was 3,500 bucks. The same amount of hours, just about. It's about 117 an hour. Now, for somebody who just left a job that was, I think I was making maybe 70 a year at Disney or something. Um, that's pretty good. That's not bad. Because I was able not just to show my value, to show my expertise, to show my experience, right? to show that social proof, but I was able to give something first. And that made all the difference. Seven years later, these are some of the clients that we've been able to work with. Sketchers has been with us since 2012. Uh, Belkin and Linksys were with us for two years. Technicolor was last year. They're rebuilding their entire website. And a month ago, we closed Applebee's. So again, I am not a salesperson, but I'm going to show you my, my proposal and then take your questions and um, hopefully make a difference. So again, these are all clients that we are working with or have worked with in the past over seven years. <clears throat> Addressing key uh, pain points. The deep research. Your competitors are doing the same thing. They're coming up with their own reports. They're coming up with their own free things that they want to offer. They're, they're doing their own research, so yours has to be better. Yours has to be like inception deep. Like I, I know on the surface you've got this issue, but I dug into it and I found out the problem really isn't this, it's this thing way over here. And if you fix that, this resolves itself. So if you do that, that extra deep research, it'll make all the difference. So here's my, my quote here, is that we close three times more of our prospects when we research their problems first. And I'll show you how I do it in my industry, even though it's gonna be a little bit different in yours. In one hour, and it takes one hour to get a really good enterprise account. In one hour, we look at their competitive market share. How are they doing versus their competitors? 
tools are out there for almost every industry. In search, the tools are uh, jump shot and compete and hit wise. We look at where they're referring sites, uh, the traffic's coming from referring sites. We look at their approximate ad budget using tools like SEMrush. <clears throat> we look at the competitor keywords. What are some of the keywords competitors are getting traffic from that they're not? And how much new business could that drive them if I did some estimates on how many people actually click and how many people, or percentage of people actually become customers? Competitor referral sources. It's gonna be another big one. Like where, where are the native advertising opportunities that might also draw and support their SEO efforts. And then basic technical issues. When I get on a call with a client and I say, hey, you know what, you know you're blocking the search engines, this little file that you have on the root of your server, you remove this one little row, you get a big percentage of your content that's not indexed already indexed. Or hey, you know you're blocking crawlers from viewing scripts and that kind of violates their, their TNC. Just giving them a couple little tidbits of advice can mean the world. And it's not IP, all that information's out there. So this is what I did. I started providing a free report beyond the, the little videos that eventually, you know, it got kind of old and convoluted. So I figured, you know, let's, let's do something else. Let's create an actual report. Uh, you can have the slides too. And if you want to see a copy of one of these, I can, I'm happy to email it to you. My free report gave a little background on me and who I am, a little table of contents. It gave some educational material to educate the client a little bit about the industry, what's going to be involved, what's important. I actually had two pages of, of data. I just put one on here for um, make it look better. But we had two pages of data, about 18 different criteria that we went through. And we provided them with some advice. And not just, this failed, you need to call me and we'll fix it, but an actual link to a video or to a supportive document and to a screenshot showing where the issue was. And at the end, I try to provide some kind of value, like a $600 voucher. Like, hey, if you, if you start up with us by the end of the month or by the end of the quarter, um, you can save $600. And step two is asking those qualifying questions that only an expert would be able to answer. Qualifying questions have been a really helpful way for me to get introduced to new clients. <clears throat> questions like, what's your current cost per acquisition goal? With paid search and with organic search. Most clients couldn't answer that. Well, I don't know. What's your current cost per acquisition right now? Well, I don't know. They don't know, but they know that you know to ask the right questions. <clears throat> what's your current market share? You know because you just did the research. So when they say, hey, what's, you know, I'm like, yeah, I don't know what my, my market share is. So I can tell you, I did some research, and you have about 15% market share for these keywords. What percentage of growth? If you, um, you know, if you look at your conversion rate, what's your percentage of growth month over month? Most of these clients had no idea. How are you improving your user experience for mobile users? The only thing I get an answer to that is, yeah, we're doing mobile. Well, what are you doing for mobile? Right, how are you optimizing your mobile experience? What's your current keyword strategy? So these are all questions I ask in my industry that have made the difference. These are qualifying questions. This is a really tough one, too. What is, what is does? That's funny. Uh, what does the current attribution model look like with your first and last clicks? They can never answer that question. They have no idea, because most of them aren't even doing any attribution modeling for their traffic. How are you earning links to your website? If you could focus on one area of SEO this year, what would it be? Here's another one. What is it you like or dislike about your current team? Now, this applies to any industry. When you ask them, how's it going with your, your marketing? How's it going with your business? What, what is it you like or dislike? And when you have that dislike list, it gives you something to answer to. You can go back and create your proposal or mold your proposal around the areas that they're struggling. You've had a really good time with this vendor, but they can't seem to get the menu into Google, right? First thing on your proposal is get menu into Google. We've had a really good experience, but they can't clean up this negative Yelp listing. First thing in our proposal is clean up Yelp listing. Here's how we're going to do it. So you blow their minds. I know that's a lot of questions, and that's exactly how the client feels when you're done. The prospect. The prospect will look at you like, oh my god, there's so much stuff, I don't know what to do. And they feel like there's a sense of deficit. They feel like I could be really doing a lot better, and I need to know how to answer these questions. So you've all heard Stephen Covey's quote, right? Look first to understand, then to be understood. And I believe that that holds true when it comes to sales. Because I'm not a salesperson, I don't know all the Zig Ziglar sales techniques, but I do understand technology and I do understand content. And so I practice active listening. I, I repeat back what they said to me. Oh, let me get this right. You're, you're saying your struggle is the fact that you have a negative Yelp listing that's really been bothering you. I'll repeat that back to them and um, make sure that they understand I'm listening. 
I'm not thinking about the sale, I'm thinking about how I can solve their problems. Another thing I do is educate first and sell second. I use this diagram from Google's Micro Moments because I thought it was so compelling. <clears throat> In my education for our clients, we teach them the three principles of search. And we teach them the three disciplines, the technology, the content, the, you know, the visibility. We teach them three strategies, right? Here's how you're going to handle technical SEO. Here's how you're going to handle contextual SEO. And then the last part is we marry together the paid and organic search. It's so funny how businesses don't understand that importance. And then when you throw something at them that they hadn't seen before, they get really excited. So you educate first and then you sell second. I don't know what's going on with the fonts here. <laughs> anyway, so Bauman Zekari runs Zivic, and he told me this once. He said, we believe in equipping our clients with the tools and knowledge they need for us to be successful. And he said us because he's talking about the vendor and the client. If he educates the client and he gets buy-in on what they're doing and why they're doing it and what the goal is, it makes selling it so much easier because everybody's already bought in. And then here's my proposal, how we sell our prospects without a sales team. I'm just going to kind of walk through some of the core elements and then kind of open the floor for questions. So we start it with, you know, kind of a pro logo, try to keep some kind of aesthetics to it. I um, can't remember the name of the font. If you email me the font, I actually did this little research, and this font, for whatever reason, on proposals, converts better. I don't know why. It starts with a B. Backersville, maybe? It's Backersville. Really interesting. Start out standard proposal. Here's what we do. You're looking to us to provide a service. Then I go right into a timeline. And again, this, is, this isn't the actual dollar pitch. This is the, the collateral page, not, not a PowerPoint presentation, but an actual Word doc that walks them through kind of what we do. So with any client, when you give them some set of expectations, here's what's going to happen one, month one after you sign up with us. Here's what's going to happen month two, and here's what's ongoing. And then you give them the service retainer options. I'm not even going to go into it. And then once, once we're done listing our service options without prices or anything, then we go through and talk about education, a brief summary of search ranking. And there's Matt Cutts, who used to be part of Google. This one's showing it. I'm going backwards again. Here we go. Um, and then this one goes into expertise. So here we've got our Google Premier Partner and us hanging out with Google. And then we have, you know, uh, when it got that congressional award and some of the magazines and features that I was showing you earlier. So we talk about expertise, trust, and authority. Then a partial list of clients. This is all part of our um, non-pricing proposal. This is just the, uh, the collateral part. Our strategic partnerships and who we work with. Our methodology, right? Um, talking about how we, we focus on relevancy and domain authority and behavior. And then we get into what it's actually like working with us. Instead of just saying, hey, when you hire us, we'll, we'll open the curtain and show you what we got. I show them right there. I'm like, here's our project management system and a sample list of tasks. We prioritize uh, with the priority column and an effort level column so that you can filter and focus on items where you need the most, uh, where you can put the least amount of effort in to get the most amount of results back. So they can see kind of a sneak peek of what it looks like and some of the tools that we give them access to. Here's on the content side, same thing, example of what they can expect to see from another account. And then at the end, I actually go, go the next level. Uh, because we're a consultancy, instead of just saying, hire us because we're great, at the end, I'll actually give them the job requisition of the people they need to hire to do the work. So like, oh, I need a guy that can do such and such. And, you know, who do I need for that? And do I need to do procurement work? I'm like, here's a job description. I actually have three. I have one for each role. I have, here's what you should look for if you're a technology person, your content person, and your outreach person. So when they get this proposal, I'm not just giving them reasons why they want to work with me. I'm giving them the starting point to hire the people that are going to do the actual work. I mean, who does that? That's IP, right? They should be paying for that. But I don't. I just give it to them because I know if they have the right team, then it's going to make my job easier. Then I get into the actual services agreement. This is a separate document that talks about pricing. So they don't even see pricing in the first one. I just kind of wow them and give them some free content and some education. And then we get an actual agreement together when they said, I'd really like to work with you. I'll go through the list of deliverables. Again, similar to the timeline chart you saw a moment ago, but it's actually listed out one by one by one. So you can actually see this is going to happen in three business days. This is going to happen in 10 business days. This is 25, and the last one kind of depends on what the plan is that they, cho they chose and who's responsible for it. It doesn't get better than this. This goes on their calendar, on our calendar, and there's a set of expectations that everybody has about what's going to happen. The term is in here, plus a performance guarantee. You've got to give your clients some sort of guarantee. If they feel like this is the wrong thing for them, or if they're not able to implement what you give them, 
you know, that's, that's not fair to keep charging them. It's just not. It's not ethically right. You move on and you hopefully that they'll give you referrals or, or you write something in that says, look, if you have to exit with us, then you've got to give us at least 10 referrals of other businesses. Do something so that you tie in something to the exit. Performance guarantees always made a really big impact to our clients. Well, what happens if in four months we don't start seeing results? Then you can stop paying us. Real easy. And then I get into the pricing. So in this case, you know, I, I show them the value, save 20% right at the top as I start talking about it, talk about return on ad spend, and then I go through the table showing the different options. This is just for a plan. Like we want a, an SEO strategy. Oh, but we might also want a paid search plan in there as well. We're a big brand. We've got you know, $20 million a year we're spending on AdWords. What do we do? So I break it out and I give them some options. And of course, you give them bundled pricing if you want to. And if they decide, you know what, I don't want an SEO plan. I'd rather just work with you because you guys are, are really good at what you do. Um, what's your retainer look like? So what I do is I roll in that, that whole 7,000 or 9,000 plan into a retainer. So I give them that option as well. Um, I'm a little bit different in my industry. There's a lot of ambiguity and fog. So I want to make my clients blatantly clear and I make them initial an area that has them understand um, you know, that they need a content writer, they need a web developer, they need someone doing outreach. And if they don't have those people, then they can't be successful and I can't be successful helping them. So I make them agree to provide those resources or I'm not going to be able to see the same results that I've seen with the other clients. And of course, a disclaimer that we can't control Google search results. You know, we'll use, to the best of our knowledge, the practices that, um, that we believe will help them, but we can't control results. And then a real simple credit card off at the end. They sign, they choose the plan they want, strategy only. Uh, they can choose a prepay option and save some money. And then they put in their billing, and they're all set. So here's the key takeaways. Do your research before the intro call so that you're educated on who they are and where their pain points already are. And then you'll hear them tell you what the pain points are, and you should already have an answer to it. Build a sense of deficit, and then equip your, cli your client with the knowledge and the tools they need to be successful. And then everyone loves happy clients. So make sure you do a good job for your accounts. And that's me, Steve Wiedemann. So if you want a copy of the, um, the uh, actual proposal, please let me know. I'm happy to. My email should be on there. I'll email it to you. Yes, sir? So Google, we, we do events with Google twice a year, and the, the one thing that they always say when they start their event is that if they're not in our directory, if you can't go to the Google preferred vendors directory, then they're probably going to be questionable. They have to have a certain record, track record with Google. They have to have had a certain spend and a performance growth um, to be able to be in their premier partner directory. So that would be the first place. If they're not a premier partner, I don't know, might want to question why. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, cool. Um, hopefully that, uh, that proposal helps you improve your proposal. And if I can, uh, if I can give you any more examples or one-on-one -on -one help, please send me an email. I'm happy to help you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, sir.